Good morning. You're listening to CKUT 90.3 FM. I'm Marana al Rabi, and I'm happy to be here this morning on the Wednesday morning after. Frank Barra joins us by telephone today, Wednesday, October 4th, 2011, from London, England. Frank is the coordinator of the Russell Tribunal on Palestine, based in London. The Russell Tribunal on Palestine is a citizens' initiative launched on March 4th, 2009, that aims to reaffirm the primacy of international law as the basis for solving the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and at raising awareness of the responsibility of the international community in the continuing denial of the rights of the Palestinian people. Frank is the editor of Gaza in Crisis, Reflections on Israel's War Against the Palestinians, and Corporate Complicity in Israel's Occupation, Evidence from the London Session of the Russell Tribunal on Palestine. Hi, Frank. Good morning, Rana. Good to speak with you and welcome you again to our CKUT radio powerhouse in Montreal. (laughs) Thanks a lot for having me. Um, So much is going on in Palestine and in Israel. There were the tent protests by Israelis that started in July in Tel Aviv. And in September, just this last month, the bid for the Palestinian state going through to the United Nations. These events present opportunities for change. What is your assessment of where things are going in Palestine and Israel, given your vantage point with the Russell Tribunal on Palestine? Yeah, I I agree that um, some very interesting uh, things have happened in the last few months or weeks. Um, to talk about uh, the um, the revolution, uh, they call it the social revolution in, in Israel, and the tent protest. Um, I'm not. I mean, I'm not able to talk about it t- too much because I'm not. You know, I'm not an Israeli. I don't live in Israel. But it seems to me, and from what I've heard from people on the ground, from uh, Israeli pro-Palestinian activists, that this um, revolution um, had anything had nothing to do with the, the you know the the plight of the, of the Palestinian people and the Palestinian citizens of Israel. So this um, social revolution touched upon a lot of internal Israeli problems, but uh, didn't really um, talk about the occupation or anything like this. So it wasn't really political. And um, I mean, from, from, you know, from what we've read and heard in the last few days, it looks like this so-called social revolution is slow, slowly dying. So um, um, I think, in, you know, in Israeli internal politics, this might have been something quite important. But in the, in the overall sort of Palestinian-Israeli conflict, I don't think this will, will really make any difference. Uh, on the other hand, the um, UN bid by the, the PA to ask for um, recognition as Palestine, uh, for you know, Palestine to be recognized as a, as a state, um, has had some very interesting repercussions. I mean, you must know that um, a lot of Palestinians actually in the diaspora were not sure about this initiative. Um, some question about the, le- you know, the legal aspect, who's going to represent the Palestinians if Palestine becomes a state, were addressed. But I think what this uh, initiative has done, I mean, is that, um, you know, the, I mean, it, it has helped the Palestinians, I think, to feel like they're back, you know, on, their, on an international stage. And I'm not sure what's going to, you know, end up with this initiative. We know that the U.S. will block the move if Palestine get, gets uh, nine votes at the U.N. Security Council, and then Palestine will probably go to the U.N. General Assembly for sort of a, an observer status. Um, so we're not sure yet what are going to be the repercussion exactly for, for about this initiative, but uh, we see that behind the scene, both, you know, the quartet, uh, so the U.S., Russia, France, etc., uh, and the EU, sorry. Uh, um, I mean, it looks like they're trying very hard to, you know, have Netanyahu and, and have Abbas sit, uh, you know, again in the same room and talk about negotiations. And it looks like this time Abbas is, uh, for the first time in his life, really, standing firm um, and saying, look, we not negotiate if we have, you know, if the precondition we've asked for, such as, you know, um, the end of settlement buildings, is not happening. So we'll have to wait and see uh, for a couple of weeks, I guess, to see really what's going to happen. But it's definitely interesting. The Russell Tribunal holds international public sessions that address complicities and omissions by states, by organizations, and by corporations in the perpetuation of violations of international law. Experts and witnesses are invited to present their information to the tribunal's jury, 
and the conclusions and verdicts are widely published. The first session of the Russell Tribunal on Palestine was held in London, England, and addressed international corporate complicity. The second session was held in Barcelona and addressed the European Union's complicity and omissions. The third international session of the Russell Tribunal on Palestine will take place on November 5th to 7th, 2011, in Cape Town in South Africa. This session will focus on the question, are Israel's practices against the Palestinian people in breach of the prohibition on apartheid under international law? Frank, is this a coincidence or a deliberate choice to organize this session on the question of Israel's apartheid in a country that lived apartheid? It's obviously a, a, a choice that we, we made actually a few years ago. Um, the places where we have the tribunal are very important. You know, in Barcelona, we had it in Barcelona because it was about the EU. And at the time, Spain was um, at the uh, presidency of the EU. We had it on corporations in London because London is one of the biggest sort of um, center for uh, corporations, etc. And we have it in South Africa, not because we want to compare South Africa, what was South Africa apartheid and what is possibly Israeli apartheid, but because of the obviously historical relevance. Apartheid, I mean, the word apartheid was created, it's a, you know, an Afrikaner's word, it was created because of apartheid South Africa. So obviously we're trying to bring an historical relevance and sort of a symbolical relevance as well to, to this session. Uh, what we think we could achieve with this session the, the first two sessions focused on corporations and the EU, which for, I think, the general public might not be as interesting as, uh, as, as we wanted it to be. But um, bringing apartheid on, 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 the, on the scene will help, bring, you know, will help us bring the session to really sort of a more humane level. We're going to hear personal stories of people in Palestine that, even if they have visas to study abroad, can't go abroad because they're stuck um, and Israel won't issue them uh, visas to leave. We have people, you know, talking about the lack of access to health, education, jobs. We have uh, union uh, members telling us how hard it is to actually uh, have a union in, in Palestine because it is controlled by Israel. Um, and we also have people that lived through apartheid in South Africa. Uh, some really eminent people, we you have know, the General Secretary of the COSATU, the biggest union in South Africa. We have uh, Winnie Mandela, obviously a, a very important figure during South Ap um, apartheid South Africa, and um, um, Archbishop Desmond Tutu as well. So we're trying to, as a whole, explain how apartheid came uh, to become a crime under international law and how Israel treatment of the Palestinian in general, so in Gaza, the occupied territories, and just the Palestinian people in general, uh, can uh, be seen under international law as possibly uh, yeah, a breach of the prohibition on the crime of apartheid. Yeah, I mean, on the website of the Russell Tribunal on Palestine, um, uh, the agenda for this third international session in South Africa is there. And, um, it, you know, you, it, it shows a thorough examination of the definition and elements of apartheid as an institutionalized regime of systematic domination and how this applies in Israel and vis-a-vis -vis Palestinians. And if, you know, when people look at the jury members for this third session and also just in general, all the organizations and individuals that endorse the Russell Tribunal, there's a growing number of highly respected members, um, including Emeritus uh, Archbishop Desmond Tutu and Pierre Galland and many others. But, you know, in, in, in your view, how can you explain the, the difficulty in um, really making the, a clear case that human rights violations, including apartheid, are an ongoing reality in Israel and Palestine and are contravening international humanitarian law as well as United Nations conventions? It, it's still difficult today to make a clear case of that, do you think? Yeah, I mean, it is very difficult. Um, it, it is very difficult for a lot of reasons. I mean, I think the first reason is it is difficult because we are talking about Israel. And we know that uh, Israel hasn't, um, you know, the same status as other countries. I mean, in the eyes and in the heads of the international, what we call the international community, so Western states, Western powers, etc. When you touch upon Israel, uh, you touch on, on a very, very tricky subject. Even if, actually, when you look at the facts and you look at the hundreds of reports that have come, come um, from Israel, from Israeli organizations, Palestinian organizations, international bodies, um, 
there's a pretty clear case that actually if you examine the facts and if you uh, compare it uh, to what is the definition of apartheid under international law, there's a pretty clear-cut case um, to show that it, you know, apart- Israeli policies could amount to apartheid. But because we are talking about Israel, uh, we're facing a, a very um, serious problem. And, you know, it's the same problems that the people, you know, um, behind the, the BDS movement are facing. Uh, problems that weren't really faced with uh, South Africa at the time. You know, after a few years, um, everyone came on board. Artists played against South Africa, apartheid, etc. It's uh, a lot harder for, for, for Israel-Palestine. I think, I mean, there's a, a few reasons, but I think the Israeli narrative has always been more prominent in the, me- in the mainstream media, and uh, people tend to watch you know, the mainstream media and tend to be educated by the mainstream media. So they've had a, a, a completely wrong view of the reality of what really happening on the ground. And, uh, and it's a problem as well, because uh, you know, when you're an activist and you go to Palestine and you, and you face all that, you, know, you see the reality of the conflict and you hear the stories, when you come back to Europe or the US and you tell those stories to people that, have, that are not really educated about the conflict, people think sometimes you're crazy and think you're making stuff up. You know? Why an 18-year-old Israeli soldier will shoot at a 12-year-old Palestinian playing football in a, in a, in a field? You know, that doesn't make sense. So part of it is like um, cognitive dissonance. You know, people don't want to admit what reality is. They, they, they know what reality is. They don't want to admit what reality is um, because um, you just challenge their, their idea, you know, they what have they been raised with, what have been, you know, what they've believed for a few years, for four years. So I think there's, there's part of it in, um, in the eyes of the people as well. And, and that's why it's, uh, it's very hard to, um, to work on the subject. But we all know that it's very important because it's a, it's a very crucial, crucial uh, topic. And it's even more crucial now after the, uh, the Arab Spring. Well, uh, you know, I, I can see that uh, <laughs> this is really all the time that we have for this for this interview. Um, and I wanted to ask you actually about the presentation by the Israeli government that is planned as part of this uh, third session on the second day. Mm-hmm. But perhaps uh, we'll have to stay tuned. Um, thank you, yeah. Frank, for, for your time today. Thanks thank a lot you for having me, Rana. Thank you for joining us. And uh, best of success on the deliberations and presentations of the third session of the Russell Tribunal in Cape Town. Thanks a lot. Have a great day. You too. So to stay current with the findings and conclusions and to support the Russell Tribunal on Palestine, please visit www.russelltribunalonpalestine, in one word, dot com. Frank Barra is a human rights activist, author, journalist, filmmaker, and the coordinator for the Russell Tribunal on Palestine. Frank joined us from London, England.